Thank you. Um, well, I guess after hearing the last speaker, I should kind of readjust my remarks and comment about the importance of free speech and the current flight from free speech, which we have going on in the United States. We have here uh, a little graph, which I view with a total alarm when my staff was able to come up with it. Um, of course, freedom of speech takes many forms in our society, the ability to write books, the ability to get on the radio, and now the ability to post things you want as an internet. I hope my good friend from Texas uh, looks at this, he left the floor right now, and sees how precarious the right to free speech is in America today. We look here, and there's a question. The U.S. government should take steps to protect false info online, even if it limits freedom of information. Now, of course, we all can disagree about a lot of things. We can disagree on politics. We can disagree on elections. We can disagree on medical facts. You know, that's why when, if we have something wrong with us medically, uh, we sometimes get a second opinion because one doctor thinks different than the other. Right now, and of course, we all know people, you know, should I take the shot? Should I not take the shot? Should I get a surgery? Should I not get a surgery? Should I get Redesivir? Not get Redesivir? Um, a lot of questions that are up in the air. There was a time when it was, could have been, uh, had an effect on election if people found out that Hunter Biden took a lot of money from people in other countries who maybe had an a, a, a underlying goal. The question is, is free speech what this country is about or not? With the Democrat Party, and this alarms me, because there, you know, I was a Democrat until I was 20 years old, and I thought Democrats were out in front of free speech and the Republicans were the state people. But we have a situation right now over the last few years in which 65% of the Democrats, a clear majority, almost two to one, the U.S. government should take steps to restrict false info online, even if this restricts freedom of information. 65%, only 28% of Republicans do. Now this graph shocks me. This weekend I'm gonna be speaking to some Republicans back in the district, and I will tell you, I'm going to tell them how disappointed I am that 28% of the Republicans responding to the poll apparently don't want freedom of information. But I would hope my colleague from Texas goes back home and explodes at the people back home that 65% of the Democrats or people leaning Democrats uh, want to restrict the free flow of information. Now you could say they only want to prevent false things from being put out there, but of course who determines what is false and who is true? You look at the next one, another sign of do you believe in free speech or not. Should tech companies take steps to restrict false info online even if it limits freedom of information? And we all know things that some people agree with and some people don't agree with. And sometimes things we once thought were tr false turn out to be true. But here again, it scares me. You know, The Democrats, when I was a Democrat and 20 years old, I'll tell you, I wouldn't have thought this way, but the Democrat Party has changed a lot. 76% thinks tech companies should restrict false info, even if it limits freedom of information. Only 37% of the Republicans feel that way. Um, that, that is a very scary thing. Scary for our country, and it comes down to what I think is the scariest thing of all, the way people think. It's not even things the government do, but it seems like, you know, I don't know if they have bad schools out there or whatever, uh, but the way people think is kind of scary. We know in Canada, to the north of us, which we thought was kind of a country like America, right now they crack down on churches. Churches! If maybe they disagree with the party line on sexual behavior. Um, we mentioned in the last election uh, things began to come out about Hunter Biden taking money uh, from foreign outfits, presumably just being given money because of the access he had to his dad. Oh, oh, we better not let that uh, out there online. We better not talk about that on TV. Oh, my goodness, that might affect the way people think. So we have this restriction going on right now, um, like I said, on the, on the COVID stuff. 
I don't know the degree to which it's influenced by campaign contributions from companies like Pfizer. I don't know whether it is the pride of the public health establishment, but we are entering into an era in this country in which we are not going to be able to say certain things unless the American public realizes that the First Amendment is borderline absolute. And the fact that such a huge party, overwhelming majorities, have no problem with know-it-alls in the government restricting what you can find online, very scary. I hope and pray that the American public wakes up on this dangerous trend. I know we're late here on Thursday. Uh, I hope my friend who just got done speaking weighs in here. But I really, I will, I will talk to Republicans this weekend, but I really hope that my colleagues on the other uh, side of the aisle come down strongly with their rank and file that apparently is against free speech and tell them the importance of free speech. The next thing I'm going to address is the Ukraine. And again, I don't think the American public is, um, or the American press, the mainstream media, is asking the right questions on this vitally important topic. We, it would be better for Ukraine, it would be better for Russia, certainly their young people, and better for the stability of the world if a peace agreement was reached. But there are too many people in this capital who I don't think for whatever reason consider peace a priority. And among those people, I'll label the Biden administration. Eventually, this war is going to come to an end. All wars come to an end eventually. The only question is the war going to come to end in 2023, 2024, 2027. Uh, as the war goes on, obviously more and more people die. More and more people are injured. More and more property is destroyed. You create hard feelings such that more and more people uh, in both Ukraine and Russia will have, en uh, have anger towards each other for years and years in the future. Nevertheless, the Biden administration, I get when I talk to them, is not aggressively looking for a peace. Now, the United States has obviously weighed in very heavily on this war. It's hard for anybody to believe that we'd be in a impartial broker, but I think there are countries like Turkey, like France, like Israel, that can be encouraged to step in and put an end to the war going on here. I've said before, war between any two countries, they should want to look for peace. But between these two countries, that's particularly so. It's not talked about enough. Ukraine has the second lowest birth rate in the world. I mean, if you have the second lowest birth rate in the world, you ought to be doing all you can to protect the few young people you have for the next generation. So among all countries, Ukraine especially should be saying, we want this war to end. Russia also has a very low birth rate. And if my district is any indication, I think a lot of the young Russians um, that are there are leaving Russia for other countries. I think in part because of the bad economy they have in Russia and because we still, despite all our foibles, have a free market economy in, in uh, the United States, uh, much less a much more honest government, I have no problem finding Russians in my district. And about a year ago, uh, over a year ago now, when I was in the San Diego sector on the southern border, during that two or three weeks I was down there, just solely in the San Diego sector, the second most common nationality coming from Mexico were Russians, which means not only does Russia have a low birth rate, but they have a lot of their younger people with their children coming to the United States to get away from Russia. So we have two countries that their number one priority really ought to be making sure we have as young people as possible and make sure they have more children or these two great cultures, Ukraine and Russia, are going to end. Uh, and instead, this war goes on. Like I said, for these two countries, it ought to be especially easy to find some sort of compromise, stop the killing. Uh, and it's especially important not only just to stop the killing right now, but we've got to remember um, Russia has hypersonic capability. They have nuclear weapons. Maybe you can say things will go on for years and years and they'll never use the weapons. I'm not sure that's true. There are obviously people in this chamber who hope that Vladimir Putin is going to be forced to set aside. There's no indication 
that his replacement will be more to our liking, and there's some indication that'll be worse. So I hope the American press corps, the comatose press corps of the United States of America, spends more time asking all the principals in that war, are you for peace or not? Would you negotiate for peace or not before any more people die? Um, and I would hope people on all sides of the aisle would be in favor of that. There's another one, but it's kind of funny. When I was a Democrat, before I was 20 years old, I thought the Republican Party was the party of war. But now it's kind of the other way around. You talk to these Democrats, and they have no desire to have this thing wrap up. I hope maybe the uh, Democrats who are around when I was in high school can step forward and say, hey, wait a minute here. The Democrat Party used to be the party of peace or at least they fancied themselves the party of peace. Maybe they never sincerely were. The next thing I'd like to talk about is in my district, I have a mosque of Ahmadiyya Muslims. And they believe things different than a lot of the mainstream Shiite, Sunni uh, Muslims believe, but that's not the major reason I, I bring them up today. I bring up their plight worldwide as other Muslim groups are persecuting them and sometimes killing them. Recently in Burkina Faso, nine men were murdered before uh, the women and children there. Uh, they are frequently persecuted in Pakistan. There are probably about 15 million Ahmadiyya Muslims in the world. About four million of those are in Pakistan. Uh, Pakistan is not exactly the most forgiving tolerant country in the world. It's not a surprise that Ahmadiyya Muslims are sometimes murdered there. But in any event, Algeria is another country in which we have mosques and they are not treated that well. It's one of the wonderful traits of the United States that while we not only believe in free speech, or at least did until recently, uh, particularly speech is protected when it's religious in nature. And it's important for all Americans to learn the lesson of what goes on in Algeria or Pakistan or Burkina Faso, that there are countries in which not only is religious speech suppressed, but people are killed for saying things that are disliked by other groups of people. Uh, and I, I wish my best for my friends who are Ahmadiyya Muslims wish the best for the, for the mosque that they currently have in Oshkosh, Wisconsin, and hope the rest of the world is supportive of them in their plight. I've spoke many times from this platform about immigration, but I'm gonna speak about it again today because I think it is even more important, if that's possible, than what's going on in uh, in the Ukraine, in Ukraine. Um, in the last month that we have information, we hit another all-time record in the number of people coming in the country. And I think whether it's because they don't care or whether it's because there are four unlimited people coming here, the American press has kind of fallen asleep on this topic more than they should have. A year ago, um, kind of the final month in December of 2020, the final month that we had a different administration, there were about 21,000 people came here. And that was a big deal. 21,000 people coming across the southern border who probably shouldn't be here. We're now at 238,000, the all-time high. 238,000 people coming across the border. I'll tell you, we ought, and digress, of that 238,000, 67,000 are gotaways. So our listeners are aware there are two groups of people when you hear about the number of people coming across the border. They're the people who check in with the Border Patrol. They look for the Border Patrol. We want asylum in the United States. They probably don't have a valid asylum claim, but once we let them in this country, they disappear into the country. There are other people called gotaways that don't check in with the Border Patrol. They are probably more dangerous because they're more likely to have drugs with them since they aren't turning themselves into the Border Patrol. They're more likely to have criminal, back, criminal records because we don't have an opportunity to do a background check on them, see whether they've committed crimes in the U.S., see whether they've committed crimes in Canada. Um, 
the number of gotaways more likely to have drugs with them has dropped from 60 or it's gone up from 21,000 two years ago to 67,000. Tripled, tripled. And what do we hear from the Biden administration? Nothing. There is another subgroup called unaccompanied minors. There was a time early on in the Trump administration when people were worried about families being separated, even though that they were trying to keep them separated for a minimum amount of time and only when people broke the law. We've now gone from 2,000 unaccompanied minors every month to 8,000 unaccompanied minors. Now, isn't that amazing? Minors are coming here without their parents' protection, without their parents knowing where they are. I mean, if our goal is to keep families together, isn't the first thing we ought to do if we find a child is spin them around and send them back to their country of origin rather than allow them to negotiate the trip from wherever, El Salvador or Brazil or wherever to somewhere in the United States? I hope the American public, somebody's you got to look to find it on the internet because the mainstream media is not going to tell you, I hope they familiarize themselves with the growing number of people come here who are not uh, adequately vetted. Now, I want to point out something else. When we talk about the number of people coming here who aren't vetted, the other side of that coin is once people come here and we found out we made a mistake, once we find out that they are um, perhaps committing crimes, uh, how many of those people are we kicking out of the country? I mean, that should be fairly automatic, right? If we have people who aren't American citizens coming here and commit crimes, why, out they go. I mean, really, nobody should be let in here illegally. But if they commit crimes, wow. Well, what do we find? In the last year before the COVID, 267,000 Americans were deported. A fair number, close to that, were deported even under Barack Obama. But about a quarter million a year Illegal, illegal aliens were deported, primarily because they broke the laws of some nature. What are we down in the most recent year, and this is well into the COVID, so it shouldn't have as big effect, we're down to about 72,000. So at the same time, the number of, of people coming here illegally has gone up by like a factor of 10. The number of people who are being deported has dropped by about three quarters. And there we're dealing with people who break the law. I was talking to a guy who was a US attorney uh, that I ran into, and he was stunned because he was a U.S. attorney at the time we changed administration. He was stunned at the new guidelines from the Biden administration, uh, the degree to which people that in the past would have been deported. It's, it's no big deal. Um, uh, so this must be a priority. The American public should wake up. I'm going to blame my Republican friends, too, for a little bit. In the last election, I think the Republicans should have spent more time talking about the illegal immigration, an area where there's such a stark difference between the parties, but for whatever reason, I don't think they talked about it enough. Now, there are so many reasons I talked about people who are criminals coming here. I'm one more time going to talk about all the illegal drugs coming across the border. 108,000 Americans a year dying of illegal drugs, primarily fentanyl, almost all those coming across the southern border. Sometimes big numbers glaze over. The number of people who die of illegal drugs in this year, I'm old enough to remember the Vietnam War. Every year, the number of people who die of illegal drugs is twice the number of people who died in 12 years in Vietnam. Think about that. I'm old enough to remember the Vietnam War. I'm old enough to remember all the students protesting, oh, too many people are dying, too many people are dying, and too many people were dying. But now, of illegal drugs, Twice as many people die every year as died in the, tw in the 12 years of Vietnam War. Those college students at University of Wisconsin at Madison, they ought to be marching up and down State Street and around the, the Bascom Hall protesting the 108,000 people who are dying and wondering what in the world their government is doing to prevent it. Now, I think a lot of it, uh, um, you know, there's something wrong if you're taking a drug that is so powerful you could die. Uh, but in any event, 108,000 deaths is too much. I suggest all my colleagues, when they go back over the weekend, if they run into their district attorneys, if they run into their sheriffs, ask in each county how many people died last year of illegal drug overdoses. We are way over the number of people who die on car accidents and homicides combined. Way more. And if somebody dies in a car accident and makes the paper, 
somebody dies in a homicide, of course it makes the paper, but way more people dying every year of illegal drug overdoses. You don't read about that at all. So and to a certain extent, I blame these 100,000 deaths, not just on the politicians and particularly President Biden who do nothing, but on our Commodore's press corps who is not ringing the bell saying it's time to do something about this illegal immigration and time to do something about this, these illegal drugs. Now, my final little area that I'm going to address today, a bill I'm introducing called the Responsible Borrowing Act. Uh, one of the crises we have in this country is the um, is the huge number of student, the huge amount of student loan debt that's out there. It's much worse than it used to be years ago. I guess a lot of the blame has to go on the universities who are selling college degrees or maybe admitting people who aren't going to get a college degree anyway. And uh, they wind up with these huge student debts. If, you're, if you plan on paying off your debt, maybe you delay having children, maybe you never have children, what a tragedy. Maybe you put off buying a house or your student loan debt is so great that, you're, um, that your credit rating is such you can't get a loan given that amount of, of, um, amount of student debt. I have what I would think is a minor bill, but I'm shocked that it's going to be considered controversial if we bring it to the floor. There was a time in this country, well into the 90s, I don't know if it was legal or they just weren't enforcing the law, in which if you were a student loan officer at a university and a student was taking out a student loan, that person was able to say, I think you're taking out too much of a loan. Maybe they'd say, I think you get a, ought to get another job. Maybe they might say, um, you're living too high on the hog. You're spending too much money. You do not have to take out a $5,000 loan. You should make a go on a $2,000 loan. Maybe they can say, given the major you're getting, you cannot expect to make enough money to pay off this loan. Well, today, believe it or not, it's against the law for these loan counselors to say, or for these uh, um, financial aid counselors to say, you ought not take out this loan. That's almost beyond belief. We, taught, we began this little lecture by talking about free speech. Now we have a situation in which we bar loan counselors from saying you ought not take out too much of a, you ought not take out a, a bigger loan. By the way, I think across the board, way too many Americans are in debt on a variety of things. Um, but uh, my bill will go back to the days in which finan financial aid administrators are able to tell students this is going to be too much of a loan. It may feel good to get that big check in your hand when you're 20 years old, but when you're 30 years old, that debt is not going to be so great. And if you would not spend so lavishly in Congress or would get a better degree or maybe delay going to college for a couple of years to make sure you are confident that you're going to complete a degree, um, this was brought to my attention from somebody who runs a university. They were appalled at it. They've been running these universities since uh, the early 1990s, and they remember the good old days when they prevented students from taking out excessive loans by telling them what a dumb financial decision. The good old days are gone. Now, when supposedly we're concerned about excessive student loan debt, we tie the hands of the financial uh, aid officers and tell them you cannot discourage people from taking out debt, at a minimum. Shouldn't that bill just fly right through here? I bet it won't fly right through here because for whatever reason, too many of the universities don't like to rain on the students' parade and tell them, you know, maybe you shouldn't go out on so many Saturday nights or maybe you should get another job bartending or, or waitressing or what have you. So some universities will fight this. But I encourage my colleagues to pass the Responsible Borrowing Act and go back to the days in which the colleges who care about their students, and there's some colleges who aren't going to take advantage of this. They don't care about their students' financial health at all once they leave. Sad to see, but I've come across it. But uh, at least we want to give the responsible colleges the right to tell their students, hey, wait a minute, um, 
you don't have to take out any more debt. Now I'd uh, like to thank you for listening to this a little bit. I hope you all learned a little bit, a bit about Ahmadiyya Muslims. I think you learned a little bit more about the huge volume of people crossing the southern border. I think you learned a little bit more about the huge number of people in our country, and particularly Democrats, I can't believe I was once a Democrat, who want to restrict free speech, and we have to be on the lookout for that and educate our young ones. Uh, and we learned a little bit about um, the Responsible Borrowing Act and how it's high time we let universities tell, tell our students we have, don't have to take out any more. And we, we also learned a little bit our government is not working for peace in, the Ukra in Ukraine. So, now that you heard that, I'm, I yield back. Does the gentleman from Wisconsin seek recognition? Well, I think they've had enough today.